All right, welcome everybody. I'm super happy to be here in my favorite city talking about my favorite language. Um, so yeah, I hope this will be a fun show. This year, all my talks are dedicated to two of us that have departed uh, earlier this year, and especially Joe Armstrong um, at Go to Copenhagen last year, which is about a year ago, was also talking, and then a few months later, um, he got um, garbage collected by the cat, like you know. Uh, the big thing in the sky. So really, kept, like you know, I, uh, my real message here is to get like you know, live every day as if it was the last day of your life, um, and enjoy yourself. Um, and one way that I enjoy myself is by trying to take complicated mathematics and turn that into code. Um, and I will kept, like take you on this journey today. Um, and we'll kind of like you know look at some fun mathematics and then see how we can turn this into a beautiful Kotlin. So here's the kind of thing. Um, these days, I, I guess we all want to write cool apps like this um, that can kind of like take some pictures and predict what is in that picture, um, whether it's cats or dogs. Um, and the question is, like, how do you write apps like that? Um, well, the traditional way to do this is to write a specification. So you write a function that takes a picture and tells you whether you know, there's a dog or a cat in the picture. And then everything is trivial, right? We have a specification, and we can just write our code. Um, unfortunately, it's not that easy. Um, in this case. So what do we do? Well, we invent a software design process. And one of the um, ways to write code is using test-driven development. Um, and I put a lot of text on this slide on purpose. Um, so let's kind of like, you know, like go through this a little bit. So what do you do with test-driven development? Is you have a whole bunch of test cases. Um, and then what you do is you write, you modify your mutating your code just a little bit to make the next test run. Okay? And then you take the next test, you mutate your program a little bit to make that test run, and so you rinse and repeat that. All right? And I don't know if people are still doing test-driven development here. Who does test-driven development here? So a couple of people. Um, I think actually this is a, a very nice way to do development. You're making sure that your program always works. That's the invariant. And you just got like add like you know a little bit of code to make the next test run, etc. Now look, let's look at um, this gentleman here, Mr. Gauchi. Um, that is like you know, like over 200 years uh, old. And he invented what's called gradient descent. So that was in the title of my talk. Now, if you read the description of gradient descent, it's very similar to test-driven development. Because what you do is you take a, an example, you can have, like, you know, you're kind of like mutating something, like, you know, the parameters of your function a little bit to make the test run. And then you take the next example, and you mutate your weights a little bit to make your test run. And the way you can like, know how to mutate your, like, your, your variables or your parameters of your function is by taking derivatives. So in some sense, or in some sense, not like in a real sense, test-driven development is extremely close to gradient descent. So it's a very kind of like iterative method where you're trying kind of like at all times to make all your tests pass, and you mutate your program a little bit to make the next example pass. Now, if you thought that test-driven development was something that was hip, it's not true. This was invented uh, by mathematicians like you know over 200 years ago. Um, 
And so the whole premise of what I'm talking about is what if instead of us as human programmers mutating our code to make the tests pass, why don't we kind of like use either a mathematician or the techniques that the mathematicians developed to do this for us, right? So if we could, do, if we could automate test-driven development um, by just feeding our development process a whole stream of examples and let that, kind of like, you know, that process update our code every time to make these test runs, our life would be great, right? Then we could go to these conferences just every day. Our code would write automatically, and we can enjoy ourselves and get, like hang out, you know, like have a party at night, etc. That's my dream world, the dream end state, right? Like that we have the machines write our code. And I'm not the only one. This is known as software 2.0, and really software 2.0. One way to look at that is automatic test-driven development. So I. You give me a whole bunch of tests, and then I will kind of like use those tests to kind of mutate some program and making sure that like, you know, it passes all the tests or it passes as many tests as possible. Um, another way to look at the difference between software 1.0 and software 2.0 and software 1.0, the humans take a specification and turn it into code. In software 2.0, you take the tests, the data, and you turn that into um, a model, which is a fancy way for um, programming. Now, if you um, know me a little bit, um, one of the tricks that I stole from mathematicians is called duality. Um, I had a very short-lived startup, which was called Applied Duality. Um, but duality is this kind of trick that is always kind of like useful. And that's, in some sense, what we're doing here as well. Um, if you look at a database, a database is a gadget that I give code, a query, and it gives me back data. What if we can like take the dual of that, if we can build a gadget that we can give data, and it will hand us back code? Well, that's what machine learning does. Right, so there's two ways to look at machine learning. One is as automated test-driven development. The other one is as the opposite of a database. Now, databases, um, and most of you here that write like, you know, business apps or even mobile apps, deal with databases all day long, every day. Right? And I'm pretty sure that like five years from now, all of you will be dealing with the dual of databases every day where you're, kind of like, you know, you're feeding some data into an algorithm, and it will give you back a model. Um, now, if you, not just for gradient descent, if you look at the history of mathematics and physics, then you will see that mathematicians and physicists have been trying to get, like, you know, chase this dream of you know, finding function approximations given data for a long time for many, many centuries. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, so um, from Galilei, Fourier, and Mr. Padet here. All right, so this is like in some sense nothing new. Mathematicians and physicists have been trying this, chasing this dream of like, if you give me a set of examples, can I kind of like find a function that kind of like describes, or the function that, that this data describes? People have been trying this forever. So this is a kind of like, you know, um, my motto. Everything interesting in computer science has been invented already by mathematicians at least 100 years ago. Um, so really, maybe we should just all go home. Um, everything of interest has already been invented. All we're doing is we're just reinventing the wheel. Um, but the nice thing is, as computer scientists, we can reinvent the wheel and make it executable, and we can make it run. So I, 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 I don't think we should all go home yet. Um, but just don't expect that you will find or invent anything original again. Every time I think I invent something original, I go on Wikipedia, and there's some mathematician that has already got, like, come up with this. So let's go back to the 16th century, 
Um, and then, like, you know, let's look at what Galilei did. And I would say he was the first data scientist. So you probably heard of his famous experiment in the Pisa Tower, where he was dropping cannonballs um, on the floor. And what he was doing is he was kind of like, you know, um, measuring the distance and the time. So like, you know, like at what, how long does it take for that cannonball to drop uh, a certain distance? Um, so that's his training data. And then what he was trying to do is he was trying to come up with a function that kept, like, you know, fits that data. All right, so can I find a function that takes a t, and then if I know, don't know the t, or sorry, if I know the t but I don't know the d, this function can then predict, like, you know, if this ball would fall for 10 seconds, how far would it be, right? So this is really kept, like what he was trying to do. And the model that he found was this thing here that you might remember from high school. The distance traveled after t seconds is uh, one half times g times t squared, where g is the magic constant 9.8. All right, and so what Galileo did is he kind of like took these measurements and then he fit the model to find what g is. Now, of course, we are computer scientists, so we're not going to get, like, do this by hand. So let's write some Kotlin code to get, like, you know, given that data, find, um, fit the model. And so what we're looking for is we're trying to find that parameter g such that, like, you know, it fits that data. So here is the is the code, um, and what you will see is that this is using gradient descent or it's using automated test-driven development. So the top three lines there um, define a variable, g, and this is like, you know, of a special type here. I, I, I like to use Unicode. So this is a, of a special type. It's called dual numbers. And I just initialize it randomly. Then I have another uh, um, constant, eta, which I kind of like initialize randomly to some very small value. And then I have my model here which is a, a function, and that function has that variable g inside. Okay, and now our task is, based on this training data, find the value of g that will make all test cases run. All right? So what do we do? Well, we can like run this loop here, this training loop, and um, th that function loss there just kind of like measures how close the answer is to the kind of like you know to do prediction, right? And they use this fancy hat um, notation for the kind of predicted value and the kind of like normal y for the uh, value that I pass in. And then here you see this kind of like gradient descent. So I'm running kind of like for each training example, I compute the loss, I take the derivative of the loss. And then I can like you know move the derivative around or the value around of g based on this derivative, um, and then I print the value of uh, g. And what you see is on this. Oh, I had a laser pointer here. Um, this one. So here you see that as I'm kind of like you know running through this loop, the value of g kind of like you know pretty quickly goes to 9.8. So I've learned that value by just giving it kind of like examples. And poor um, Galileo had to do all this by hand, and we kept like, you know, do this automatically. Now what I'm going to tell you in the rest of the talk is how to kind of like, you know, implement this magic kind of like, you know, type here D that allows you to kind of like, you know, take derivatives easily like this. And then you can kind of like, you know, do arbitrary machine learning um, in this way. But let, let's look at some other examples um, where people do function approximation. Um, probably most of you have heard of Fourier transforms, right? You can take any um, function um, that's periodic, and you can write that as a combination of sines and cosines. Right, so here's a kind of like you know an example where I take a, the squared function, and I kind of like you know I take 
a finite sum of sines and cosines. And what you see is that like, it approximates it pretty well, except here you see that there's like, you know, like a little bit of a weird thing going on here. Um, and the, cap, like, you know, the longer I make this um, sum, the better this appro approximation gets. Um, or in the cap, like modern machine learning words, the deeper I make the neural net, the better it approximates this function. Um, Here's another one. This is like maybe less well known. So you can also um, approximate functions using the so-called uh, Pade series. And what that does is it just like you know it's this um, fraction of two polynomials. Um, and if I take the sine function here and I train it on this interval, you see that it perfectly got like you know um, shows the sine function. But what I when I try to ask what the value is for values that were not in the training set, you will see that it doesn't give the right answer. Um, now, that happens with real neural nets as well. And this is where you get these adversarial examples where you change one pixel in your image, and suddenly, instead of like a stop sign, it says, like, you know, there's no speed limit. Um, so these simple examples already show you, kind of like, you know, a lot of the things that happen in, um, like, big neural nets. Um, but the real point I'm trying to drive home is that these are like 200 year or 300 year old attempts to get, like, take training data and turn them into a function. Um, except by the, at that time, people didn't have computers, so they had to do all this uh, by hand. Um, what we will do is we'll now jump into get, like, the, the, the hype of the moment. So we'll look at deep learning using artificial neural networks. Um, so what is an artificial neural network? Well, let's first sit, like, you know, um, look why they are interesting. And they're interesting because if you go, like, you know, to Wikipedia or something, you can find this theorem from 1998 that says that um, using a neural net, um, you can approximate any continuous function. So, in some sense, a neural net is very similar to a Fourier series or a Pade um, construction. You can, you know, if you feed it enough data, it can approximate any function. And that's exactly what we were trying to do, right? So, um, um, so they, they are a tool that serves our needs. Um, but the other thing is that they're very useful to get, like, you know, or, or their shape is super useful to get, like, run on modern computers. So let's look at what is a neuron here, a neural network. So a neural network is composed out of neurons. Now, I don't believe that these things have anything to do with, like, you know, neurons in your brain, right? They're just, like, it's the same thing as, like, you know, a Fourier transfer where you have sines and cosines. Here you have these, kind of like, neurons, um, and they consist of three things. So there's inputs. Now what you do is you multiply the inputs by some weights. And so those are the weights, the kind of parameters that I just showed you, the G um, from the, the Galileo's model. Then you add them, and then you apply something that's called an activation function. So these machine learning people like to use fancy words, activation functions, whatever. Then they also say, like, this is linear algebra, because what you're doing is you're multiplying something and then summing it up. That looks like, you know, um, the inner product of two vectors or something. The way I look at this stuff is like it has nothing to do with linear algebra. Linear algebra has to do with is a, like an, a, a, a matrix is a representation of a linear function. Okay, and a linear function is something that has very kind of like, you know, nice mathematical properties. But here, really, what you're doing is you're using matrices as a form of MapReduce. Because what you're doing is you're doing additions and multiplication. And so the way I look at these things, it has nothing to do with linear algebra. If you, if you think about all this stuff as just doing map reduce, and we'll see some concrete examples later, your life will be much easier. So to do machine learning, you don't need linear algebra. Think of it as just doing map reduce. You're kind of like having like arrays of numbers that you multiply and add. So what is multiplying like an array with some weights? That's a map. What is adding them up? That's a reduce. So we all know this. Um, 
And then what you do is, this is really a function, right? So it's a function that takes inputs and returns an output. And then a neural net is just a composition of these functions. So really, these neural nets are func functions, compositions of functions. And then what we're trying to do is we're trying to get, like, learn these weights such that this generic function will be trained to approximate the training data that we give it. Um, and as I said, like, you know, like if you look at papers about this stuff, computer science papers, they're full of complicated math. Um, what I will tell you or try to explain to you, don't need that math. And that's what I hope to tell you. So let's look at the most trivial example of a neuron. What is the most trivial input? That's just one input, so a neuron with one input. So let's give it one input. Then we multiply it by a weight. We sum it. Well, like summing it doesn't do anything. And then we needed that function. Let's take the identity for that. All right? So one weight, um, one input, and just the identity function. And if I then write this down, we get like you know, this thing. The output is A times the input. Well, that's a linear regression that you might know also from high school or maybe even from kindergarten. So linear regression is really the world's simplest neural network. And the way I look at things is that if you can understand how all this works for linear regression, you can kind of like, you know, generalize to, to more complicated things. So let's kind of like focus on these linear regression things. And then, you know, we built what we want to do based on this. And then a, a neural net is just kind of like, you know, composition of these things where you're, you're just having more inputs. You don't use the identity function and you stack them up. But in principle, there's nothing different. So always when you're trying, when you're trying to do stuff with machine learning, try to reduce it down to the most trivial example. Build your understanding and then build it up. It's like the hello world of machine learning. And the machine learning people are not very good in hello world things. They always get their hello world is more like pet shop or something. What was the, kind of the old Java kind of thing? That's their hello world. All right. So let's then look at kind of like, you know, um, how this linear regression works. Um, so you get this, the training data. Um, and what you're trying to do is you're trying to find this line that best fits the training data. Um, and that line is given by the model, right? A times X. So we're trying to find this Y hat, the A, such that that line kind of like best fits the data. What does that mean, best fit? That means that the error kind of like, you know, that you have here, these kind of like vertical lines, that that is minimized. Now, this is kind of like interesting. Because that's a very strong assumption here. What you assume is that the x coordinate is kind of like correct and that the error is only in the y coordinate. And um, this is something that people never tell you when you do linear regression. Is they kind of say, oh yes, you know, the x the x values are correct and the only errors in the y values. Well, if you think about the Galileo example, there's time and distance, there's measurement errors in both time and distance. Now, if you want to do regression when you assume errors in both variables, you get something called ortho orthogonal regression or Deming regression or errors in variables, and the math becomes much more complicated. So I won't do that here. But just rest assured that people are lying to you when they teach you linear regression, and they say that it's got the right thing, because it makes a very strong assumption that the inputs don't have errors. But inputs might have errors, and then you need some more complicated math. All right. Let's plot the, uh, the, the function that describes the error here. So the error was defined as like, you know, y minus y hat squared. And if I can just substitute everything, that becomes y minus ax squared. Now, if I plot that function, um, and here's the sad thing. I think on the JVM ecosystem, including Kotlin, we don't have a standard plotting library. I think that's a big miss. 
Um, the reason people love, like, say, Python notebooks is that it's really easy to get, like, you know, if you have some, like, a function to plot the kind of graph of that function. In the JVM ecosystem, it's just freaking impossible. Right? So I think if you like, this is something that we really need as a community. We need some easy plotting libraries. Otherwise, we won't, will never win against Python. Um, and so I can plot this by hand because I had no choice. I, I don't know. Like, it takes me one second to draw by hand. If I would have to find which of the 50 half-baked libraries I can use to do plotting, I would not be standing here. But anyway, if we plot that function, if we manage to plot the function, you see that it's this kind of like thing here. And we're looking for the value um, for the parameter a that makes this thing kind of like you know zero. Um, now, in, the, in yellow, you see the derivative. So you see the derivative of the error with respect to a. If that's negative, and now I'm going to get like, I'm not going to try to, oops, say what's left and right. So I'm going to point at the screen here. So if the derivative is negative, we're on this side. And now we need to get like the, the minimum is to the right here. If the derivative is positive, the minimum is to the left here. So what we need to do is we need to update our weight to get like you know based on the derivative and then there's a step size to get like you know to make that a little bit smaller and this is the gap like this update loop from gradient descent All right so this is our version of test driven development we're trying to get make as many tests run as we can by kind of like updating that weight um so here's the code again in kotlin um so we have our cap, like you know, our parameter. We have like you know this step size. We have our model and our loss, and then we run this training set. And then here, I cheat with the syntax here because I want to get like write the derivative like this. In Kotlin, you have to use kind of like ticks, but that I, I I'm scared of ticks. They cause Lyme disease, so I can like don't write ticks in my code either. Um, but here I need to get like take the derivative by hand. So here's a pro tip. If you ever have to take a derivative by hand, use Wolfram Alpha. You just type in your function. It will get, like, compute the derivative for you. That's the way I test this stuff. But anyway, like, you see that it's um, quite a bit of work to compute the derivative here by hand. Um, and that's what we're going to automate. So there's, and then there's the other question is like, how do I take the step size? I kind of like waved my hands like a little bit about that step size. So there's two questions. How do I compute derivatives? And how do I kind of like take that step size? So to compute these derivatives, um, we're going to use some more very ancient mathematics. Uh, from this uh, gentleman here, uh, William Clifford, um, and I think he invented that in somewhere like you know 1860. All right. So what are these cap like you know? And so he is really the one that invented differentiable programming. Um, now what is the deal here? So I hope everybody still remembers complex numbers. By the way, great naming, right? Because when you hear complex numbers, you think, oh, this is complicated. Um, it's not complicated. It's just a pair of two numbers um, where the cap, like, you know, if you square the i, it's minus 1. What's weird about, like, i square equals minus 1? I don't know. Um, then you can ask yourself, well, if I can define i square to be minus 1, why not define i square to be 0? Right? Because there's only three choices, 1, 0, or minus 1. So let's kind of just pick i square equals minus 1. And to kind of avoid ambiguity, instead of i, I will call it epsilon. Right? So a dual number is just a complex number, except that i squared equals minus 1. We replace that with epsilon squared equals 0. That's it. By the way, you can also take i squared equals 1 then people usually write it as j, and then what you get is something, it's called the hyperbolic numbers, which are apparently useful in physics. But we're going to focus on these dual numbers. So dual numbers are just complex numbers, except that i square equals minus 1, i square equals 0. 
Now let's look at the function f equals 3x squared plus 4. What is the derivative of that function? You remember this from high school or you use Wolfram Alpha, right? That's like, you know, 3 times 2x plus 0, so 6x. Okay, so if I take this function fx equals 3x squared plus 4, if I take the derivative, I get 6x. Now let's apply this function to the dual number. So we're going to compute f of a plus b epsilon. So I do just some simple math. I just substitute it here, right? x is a plus b epsilon. I got like, you know, we all remember this thing here, a plus b epsilon squared is a squared plus 2b, blah, 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 blah. Get it here. Just simplify it here. And guess what? Here we recognize 3a squared plus 4, that's f of a. And then here 6a, that's the derivative of f applied to a. And then 3 epsilon squared, epsilon squared plus 0. So if we apply a function to a dual number, magically it computes the value of the function plus its derivative. Isn't that amazing? So this is the way we're going to compute derivatives. And, but I want you to get, like, you should, I have this tattooed on my arm, all right? This is the magic formula that we are kind of like going to use here. So if I call a f this function on a dual number, it computes a new dual number that consists of the value of the function plus the value of the derivative. It's just, this is the best thing ever. Right? Now, maybe you remember from high school or kindergarten, like all these other rules, like um, sum rule, like how do I take the derivative of a sum? Oh, you got like, you know, that's the sum of the derivatives. How do I take the derivative of a product? It's the, well, I've heard this got like weird sum of products. And then this one, like how do I take the derivative of a composition of functions? It's called the chain rule. I, don't, I cannot remember the chain rule. I always have to go to Wikipedia to look it up. But here's the nice thing. If you're using these dual numbers, you don't even have to remember this. You can just compute it, right? Let's look at here the um, chain rule. I'm just kept like, you know, computing here the composition of two functions and the chain rule falls off. So all the time that you spent in high school learning about derivatives was wasted time. I think the teachers just wanted you to kind of keep you off the street such that you wouldn't get like, you know, whatever, and smash in get like, you know, glass or something. They just kept you busy. Because if they would have taught you dual numbers in high school, you know, you could have done this automatically. Or you could have written code. All right? So here's the code for dual numbers in Kotlin. Um, so a dual number was a pair of numbers of the real part and this epsilon part. And I'll just initialize that to 1. And then if, the, if I compute a function on the dual number, that was like, you know, the value of the function plus its derivative. So for the, for the base functions, I just have to kind of instantiate it like this. So I compute the function plus its derivative. And then here are the kind of like the arithmetic operators. Um, and they just follow the kind of like the product rules and the sum rules and whatever. Um, and these were exactly the same things that I calculated by hand. So I just transcribed the, the kind of like you know the, the math into Kotlin. So in ten lines of code, you have now a fully automatic derivative system. So you can take any function and compute its derivative just by overloading the operators on dual numbers. Isn't that beautiful? So let's kind of like, you know, look at our little example. We had to compute the derivative by hand here. And this is where we had like, you know, the, our regular numbers. Let's replace this by dual numbers. So now instead of having this a to be a, 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 a float, I make it a dual number. And to compute the derivative, and again, notice that I'm using syntax cheat here, um, I just look, Take the, I compute e, and then I take the epsilon part, that's the derivative, and then I can just update the step size. Done. All right, so now I can do gradient descent just using dual numbers, nothing else. Um, now the next thing, so the talk was called, like, you know, gradient descent, the ultimate optimizer. 
So now, like, you know, and the two things that were hard was finding the derivatives. We now found how easy it is to find derivatives using these dual numbers. Second thing is, like, how do I find the step size? And if I look at, at our example again, um, let's go here. Um, if I plot, in this case here, this, this function here, when I, tri I use it for data that computes pi, you see that it's got, like, you know, it, it converges quickly to get, like, compute pi. But if, if I look at the error, if I would plot the error here, where is it here? If I would plot E, it got, like, it looks really weird. And if I change this, the kind of step size here, I can change this graph and I can get it nice. But it requires a lot of tuning. And uh, people that do, like, if you do this for, for a big neural network, people spend a lot of time messing with these hyperparameters. Um, now, since we're computer scientists, let's let, it makes sense to get, like, what, can, we, can we not learn these hyperparameters? Um, and that's what I'm going to show you, how to do that. Oops. So here's what we're going to do. Instead of, get, like, you know, um, updating the weight of my model with the derivative here, I'm also going to take, make the step size into a parameter. And so what I need to do now is I need to take, be able to take the derivative of the error with respect to the step size. Then I need a meta step size, and then I just update my step size based on that. And then I also need to update my weight of my model based on the step size, right? So I just got like do exactly the same thing. I make my step size here into another parameter of my model. So now I need to take the derivative of the error with respect to that thing and then update that. And then this guy is the constant, but I could kind of like stack this all the way up, right? So I could make this into a parameter as well and learn that. Okay, so let's see if this actually works in code. Um, and there, boom. It doesn't work. Because what I need to do now is I need to take the derivative with respect to two variables. I need to take the derivative of the error with respect to the step size and with respect to the weight. Um, and if I do that, it goes wrong. Because I only have one slot here in my dual number for the derivative. And if I compute the, 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 um, the value of, like, you know, say, a times b, what you will see is that it will kind of, like, you know, add up the derivatives for each of those. And it gets confused. Um, and here you can see kind of like what happens if I run that. Um, so if I take x and y and I multiply that, it will find that the derivative here is 8. And that's completely wrong. Um, so what we need to do is we need to get, kind of like, you know, have multiple of these epsilons. For every variable that we want to take the derivative of, we need to get, like, have an, 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 an epsilon here. Okay? So we need infinitely many. Um, and then everything works out. Um, and here's the Kotlin code for that. So all that we need to do is we need to, get, like, you know, implement arithmetic over lists of numbers. And then the code for the dual numbers itself doesn't change at all. So this is kind of beautiful, right? So I just overload um, arithmetic over lists. And remember that I said this is all just like map reduce. Um, so you can say, oh, this is linear algebra. No, it's just like zipping and kind of like doing mapping and zipping. That's all we're doing. So I overload arithmetic over lists. And then the definition of dual numbers doesn't change, except that instead of having a single number here, I take a list of numbers. Everything else remains the same. Um, now, if you want to be fancy, this is called synthetic differential geometry, and now suddenly we're doing advanced category theory. But really, from a programming perspective, we just replaced a single number by a list. But for mathematicians, this is a big deal, not for us. Um, now, when I do this, now when I compute the product of x and y, I get two derivatives, right? And Suddenly, the mathematicians start to get, like, use a different symbol. It's an unpronounceable thing. It's not even like a letter or something. 
Um, but this is the derivative with respect to x and the derivative with respect to y, and I'm computing this kind of list. And so instead of having 18, which kind of like would, or 8, sorry, which would sum these up, I just get them separately. Um, and now I can do what I wanted to do. And here I'm just kind of like even going like three steps high. So I'm kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm computing three derivatives and I'm updating the kind of like the, um, the weight, I'm updating the step size, I'm updating the step step size, and then I have like this, finally, this constant here that's just a, a simple value. And if you look at this, you will see that it very quickly learns the right value of the step size. So I, I started with a very small step size, and in no time it has learned the right value here. So I don't even have to, what's that, five minutes? Good. So I don't even have to get like, um, understand what to take for the step size, it will all be learned. So because I know how to take derivatives, all of this follows automatically. Right now you can ask yourself, Eric, you showed like, you know, the most trivial neural net, does it work for more complicated things? Well, this is the gap, like the hello world of machine learning is MNIST, is how to recognize handwritten digits. And so here what you will see is that the step size, if I take the step size, to be whatever here, 0 0.1, this is the error. So you see that the error kind of like drops like this. If I take the step size to be 1, then the error kind of like doesn't get very small. If I take the step size to be like 100, now you see that it does kind of like go simpler. Now, if I do this for a lot of step sizes, this is the graph that you will see. What I want you to take away from this is that the, uh, the optimal step size is somewhere here, because lower is better. And so people spend a lot of time finding the right step size, the right hyperparameter, hyper because the, the, the more optimal the step size, the, the better your model works. Um, now, if we use this trick that we just showed, what you will see is that it will learn the kind of like the right step size, and you see that it's kind of like right there. Um, it's a little bit 3D thing, but this is like you know right on top of here. So it's kind of like you know it's very much like you know finding the optimal uh, step size very easily. Um, now you can get even fancier. So like instead of gradient descent, you can do the update, the weight updates, like a little bit fancier. It all works out um, pretty well. Okay, so now, but now you can ask yourself, like, we built this tower of things, like, how do you pick the gap, like, the ultimate step size, you know, at the, at the top of the tower? Well, um, what we did is we just got, like, run this gap, like, thing, like, multiple times, so we got, like, stack this thing, up, like, really high. And what you see is that the more you stack it, this is the gap, like, you know, this is where you're, you find the gap, like, the, the best performance. And you see that this region gets bigger and bigger. Okay? And what that means, and this is logarithmic here, it means that after just stacking four of those hyper hyperparameters, it really doesn't matter anymore what your initial step size is. You can just give it a very small number, and it will learn it really quickly. Um, so. What this really says is you don't have to get, like, you know, think about this step size anymore. Um, if you want to read about it, we have a paper. Um, and then, I don't have, I cannot do this in one minute, but um, I've been lying a little bit to you because I said, like, you know, it's really easy to do this automatic derivation using dual numbers. Well, yes, if you can live with quadratic time complexity, it is. Um, so this thing takes quadratic time, um, but if you can have, like you know write a lot of code, um, and the slides will be available. Oops! Um, if you write a lot of code, you will end up with this version of dual numbers that uses continuations. Here's the continuation, um, but the interface looks exactly the same. Um, and all of this is kind of like mechanical transformation. And this one kind of like, you know, runs in linear time. And this is kind of like, you know, continuation passing style. So um, you can just take these dual numbers and transform them into something else that's more efficient. Um, 
And so we take these dual numbers and turn them into backwards AD. My last slide here is, I hope that I've convinced you that the way to, to, get, like, you know, to write code is to take training data, have a model, learn the weights using gradient descent. Then the hyperparameters that you need to train this model, you can train them themselves using gradient descent. And then implementing um, differentiation is got like you know it's just like like programming, and you overload your arithmetic operators in some form of dual numbers. For efficiency, you need dual numbers that are a little bit more complicated that use continuations. Um, but yeah, that's got like what's going on. Um, and thank you so much. And I, the code will be available, um, and the slides will be there, so you can get like just all do this for yourself. Thank you.